say it's me, Jojo from Jersey, and Chapter I have something to say. Nikki Haley is still in the race. And that one thing, above all other things, sends Trump into a level of rage unlike just about anything else. Well, coupled with the fact that she's a woman. It's like adding poison to the tip of the spear you're about to thrust into his girdle. You mean this person I know to be quantitatively better than me on like every conceivable level didn't kneel down for me immediately and she's a woman? Yeah, that's my Trump, it's not great. Merely existing gets under his paper thin skin as it is. That she won't bend the knee, she will. It's coming, she'll inevitably endorse him and it's going to be painful to watch and no, the word coming is not typically associated with a woman when we're talking about Trump, but I digress. Here's the thing, Nikki needs to keep poking him, only harder, which admittedly sounds like some kind of torture banned by the Geneva Convention, but either way, it's those million pokes that really set Tinderbox Tan Mama blaze. Trump won New Hampshire, as expected, but his victory speech was anything but triumphant. In fact, it was a masterclass in narcissistic injury, but for the purposes of the Melted Circus Peanut, we can refer to it by its more common name, a Trumpian temper tantrum. Why? Because Nikki put on a pretty dress and gave a speech that kind of sounded like she thought she had won something. And that was all she did. But it lit his ass on fire like it was Steve Bannon's bowels after a 16th fireball before breakfast. At the end of the day, Donald Trump really is a petulant toddler in perpetual tantrum trapped inside the body of a senile syphilitic septuagenarian. Yeah, he's a sociopath too, and a criminal con man who thinks in threats, revenge, retribution at all times. But if you really want to make an impact, you have to punch below the belt or kick. Okay, can't see his belt and he can't either, but it's metaphorical. Although who wouldn't line up to kick him below the literal belt? I know I would. You have to go after him where you can be sure it'll hurt the most. And you don't have to guess where that is because he tells us all the time. Everything he says, he is smart, stable, strong, a genius. You name it, he knows he is not. He knows that he's none of that. So he surrounds himself with people who lie and tell him he is. He stands on stage flanked by all those men he's vanquished. And their genuflection proves to the world that he's all the things he knows he's not. So when he says he has good cognitive, you call him senile. When he says he had a great economy, you say he left office with less jobs than he came in with. The worst jobs record since Hoover. And then you lean hard on Hoover because he really effing hates Hoover. You ding him on his makeup and his diaper and the fact that he's been wearing the same effing suit and tie since the Beatles broke up. And you do that every single time he holds one of his accordion hands, a grieved man baby rants. You hold one too. Once he seems utterly unable of focusing on anything other than you, you shift into high gear. That's when you stand outside his courtroom detailing the charges against him. That's when you make funny ads about his confusion. That's when you invite E. Jean Carroll and Hillary Clinton to a luncheon where you start to pour Trump wine before tasting it and spitting it out for the cameras. And that is when you drop the hammer. You run an ad of Barack Obama mocking him at the White House press course dinner all those years ago, and you just run clip after clip after clip of anyone who's ever attacked laughing. And you end it by calling him a joke. Can you even imagine how he would implode at that point. He's been truthing about E. Jean Carroll into the wee hours of the morning for years, and she's not potentially standing in the way of his totally ultimate MAGA forever immunity. Nikki is. By that point, you don't have to do or say anything. The toy's wound up about as much as it's gonna get, and you really just need to get out of the way and watch. He's so easy to manipulate, so easy to trigger. For whatever reason, Republicans have been afraid to go there, but Nikki has nothing to lose. They'll never leave Trump. And while he can't win without with only them, she can't win without them. So I say she just goes for it. Maybe she can actually salvage her reputation to a point where she has a viable shot at the presidency again someday. I doubt it, and I hope not, but still. I don't have to like her, I don't have to be cool with her inability to cite slavery as the cause of the Civil War, but I'm also not oblivious to the fact that at this very moment, She's one of the best weapons we have. Trump himself is the best weapon we have. And if someone like Nikki can poke him just enough to really let the floodgates down and show the American people just how effing unhinged he is, then it will all have been worth it. So here's to Nikki, paying back her debt to the American people for flip-flopping on Trump so frequently by wearing a not-so-fancy dress, painting on a sweet smothered smile, and kicking that traitorous, you know what, right where it hurts most, his nagging insecurities. And it's groin. She can kick him there too. Although, upon reflection, that's probably redundant. So go get him, Nikki. She won't do any of this, of course, because fecklessness is a party platform, but it sure is fun to imagine she would, because I know I sure would. My guest today is Andy Ostroy. Andy is an entrepreneur, film and television producer, and director, podcaster, writer, and nonprofit founder. 
He spent 35 years in marketing, including 20 at Bellardi Ostroy, the firm he co-founded in 1997. He directed and produced Adrian, the 2021 HBO documentary about his late wife, actor, writer, director, Adrian Shelley, waitress, who was murdered in 2006. Following her death, he produced Serious Moonlight, a script she'd written and which starred Meg Ryan and Timothy Hutton, and it was directed by Cheryl Hines. He's currently working on a stage version of the script and is also an executive producer of a scripted television series in development. In 2006, he founded and is executive director of the Adrian Shelley Foundation, which has awarded over 100 production grants to female filmmakers. I have talked to Andy a few times on his podcast, Now Mine, but also over the phone and, and you know, DM. And he's just a really fun, cool, smart, snarky, sassy, funny guy who keeps it real. We kind of riff off of each other, which is always fun. This is definitely a Trump heavy conversation, which personally I feel very comfortable doing and Andy's really good at it too. So now that Donald Trump has to pay 83.3 million bucks plus the other six basically had to pay to E. Jean Carroll, it's kind of fun to sort of dump on him at the moment, <laughs> always. But anyway, um, I really hope you enjoyed this episode and I'll see you next time. Welcome to the Are You Effing Kidding Me podcast, Andy Ostroy. Hey, Jojo. Hey, so I did yours and now you're doing my podcast and I had such a good time on your podcast. I got to talk about myself for like an hour straight. Yeah, this is like the adult version. When I was in, in kindergarten, we'd call this, you show me yours and I'll show you mine. But now we're doing like the adult podcast version. <laughs> yes, I did. Remember, I did take off my shirt on yours. So it's only. You, you do my podcast, I'll do yours. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, we but we would be under like, I don't know what it was called. That like jungle gym that was like, you know, like an arch and it we would be hiding under there, and then I we would say, "Circle yes or no." Do you want to do my podcast, Andy? That would be how that would yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you circled yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, and I didn't really take my shirt off on your podcast. That was a joke. Um, no, that was a joke. We have the same a fun kitchen joke. clock. How about that? totally random? We have exactly the same kitchen clock, and my kitchen clock is into me what your kitchen clock is to me, but like further away. So it's this whole very strange. Being wow. John Malkovich thing that's happening for me right now. Takes great time. <laughs> it does. Actually, no, mine is stuck. I didn't change the battery. But again, I, I'm going to run off on a million tangents. I need to get on, on task. So huh? let's start with, you just posted mm -hmm. it. I just saw on what I so-called Twitter. I think you do too. Some news that just broke. John Stewart is coming back to host the daily show on maybe just Mondays or maybe more. I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't dive into the details. I was in the middle of something, but I saw it and I was like, wow, this is great. Best news. And, uh, so yeah, I'm, well, what I, what I initially saw was that he was coming back as an executive producer and sometimes host. I don't know what that means. Mm. Uh, maybe, uh, obviously you, you, I think you have more information than I do at this point, but, uh, I'm kind of hoping that it morphs into something more extensive than that. Uh, I can't, it's hard for me to believe that he has not been the host of that show for the last bazillion years during all this Trump craziness. He's what kept me and a billion other people sane. Oh, a thousand percent. And and I think also there's there's this other place that he fills a void, which is like people who kind of tuned out from traditional media and they're not really watching the news. They feel like, well, and we'll get into that too. The news is just both sides and everything, et cetera, et cetera. They would watch him for their news. You know, which is crazy, but that was the way they could handle it was palatable for right. them. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of those people are totally tapped out and they'll be like, oh, OK, well, I can watch John Stewart. And that, I think, might save this fucking democracy. You never know. Yeah. No, I, it's I think um, it's, it's for me personally, it wasn't so much about his delivering the news, but just sort of making sense of it in a way that didn't make me want to go up on the roof and jump off. Yeah. Well, I'm very happy he's coming back because this year I think is going to be cray cray. Oh, we need it. And the thing too is like, 
sometimes you think, am I crazy? Am I losing my mind for feeling this stuff right now in this crazy world that we're living in? And then John Stewart comes on and he's like, you're not fucking crazy. Right. This is crazy. And like you feel, he's like, he makes you feel like, okay, I'm not losing my mind. Like everyone out there is going, did Donald Trump just say that if Nikki Haley doesn't drop out of the race, that she's essentially, he's going to like, She's threatening her with investigations, but like it was such a mobster thing to do. But I yeah. feel like John Stewart would be like, yeah, this happened. He's a mobster. And that's yeah. what he did. And that's what he said. It's exactly what he said, because he says all the quiet parts out loud. And it's going to be these these next five weeks or six weeks, whatever, between now and, and Super Tuesday and the South Carolina primary are going to be insane. He is going to be off the rails. And I was thinking... You know, Trump is so easy. His buttons are so easy to push. And he's losing his mind that she is is sort of out there kind of saying that she won. Yeah. It's kind of ironic, given what he's been doing since 2020. You know, it's very rich that the guy who created the big lie and still perpetrates it is whining about somebody intimating that they won something that they didn't. But I think if she keeps doing that, as I think she did purposefully last night. Yeah. He's going to lose his shit. Oh. And we saw that. We saw it. I mean, think about it. His victory speech was the most whining, mm -hmm. lacking in graciousness speech ever. Like, he should have just been happy. Hey, thanks, Nikki. You're right. I'm done. But the fact that he had, listen, you got to listen to his words. His words were all about she's delusional she thinks she won blah 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 well duh where we where have we heard that before <laughs> she just and and i don't give her a lot of credit for a lot of things because i i think that she might be the most weather cocky weather cock in the history of weather cocking other than maybe marco rubio but let's just say that she wore the dress intentionally last night because you know she was dressed up as if she had won and let's just say that let's just say it's possible i will give her this that that was intentional to get under his skin oh. it worked a thousand percent <laughs> because He's expecting her to, like DeSantis and all those other weak men before him, to basically yield and kiss the ring. And it's not just that she didn't, but it's that she's a woman and she yeah. didn't. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, if you're suggesting he has a problem with women. No. no, you're right. I think you hit on something. I think he <laughs> is losing his mind that uh, another woman is coming for him. <laughs> and... <laughs> He's not, he, he's just not capable of saying, I'm so far ahead. What am I worrying about? Right. Mm -hmm. I just relish in my victory, but he, he's, mm. he's, a, he's a toddler. And, and if you understand him the same way Putin understands him and has played him like a fiddle for the last nine years, if you understand Trump, it's not easy to, to get his goat. Like he's, he's, he's got paper thin skin. He's, he has crippling insecurities mm -hmm. and he's all about size and, and uh, optics. And all you got to do is just attack him from those fronts and, and you can really get to him and make him do and say really dumb things publicly. I think that's why the Lincoln project has been so successful over the years, because that's what they do. And that, you know, they, there's that Michelle Obama quote about, you know, when they go low, we go high. And I don't always, I know I don't subscribe to that as a philosophy in general, most of the time when it comes to Republicans, but that doesn't work with Trump. No. <laughs> you, can't. No, you can't go. No. If, if they go low with Trump, you got to go like under the surface. You got to yeah. be underground where he can't even see you when it's happening. Well, or like under, maybe just under his stomach, which is, you know, like the, like the taint area. I don't think he would know oh. if you were there. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so, sorry, he can't see it. By the way, I, I laughed really hard when you, you said it, folks. You went to the Trump taint. Oh. <laughs> no. Oh, I'm going to have That's that. That's not the first time I've been there. In my head for the next week. <laughs> but you, you, I laughed really heartily when you said another woman was coming for him. And I don't know if you meant it to be funny, but I just, I No, <laughs> no. I, it was not a pun intended, okay. but I get the pun now. And I, I, that <laughs> sorry. One. That's where my head obviously goes yeah. pretty early. Know. But yeah, I mean, the, he is very easily. Played. And by the way, to riff on your joke, I have yeah. to just say, I'm willing to bet there was, there have not been a lot of women coming for Trump in his life. <laughs> Maybe least, none. Maybe none. At least not for long. No, no. He doesn't strike me as being a generous lover, if you know well, what I mean. 
<laughs> well, no. <clears throat> and we have from Stormy's information from her intel. Yes. That, yeah. Right. We have in, we have inside info. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. yeah. Oh <laughs> now that, God. Wow. Now that That's everyone's fast. and now that everyone's turned this podcast off because I mentioned his taint and and <laughs> Either they've turned it off or they've gotten rid of everything else that's going on in the house so they could just focus on this. <laughs> just, they really want to have, they want to listen to us have a conversation about Trump's team. Um, but getting back to um, Trump and how easily, you know, like manipulated he is because he is, he is a toddler. You said it. I think of him as like this petulant, perpetually tantruming toddler, like wrapped up in this senile syphilitic septuagenarian that's the way i describe him I and mean, that's really what he is and it's always because he's not just a toddler he's tantruming all the time like he he's veruca salt like he wants the golden goose but it's just like he's never Ruka satisfied salt. nice right? reference oh thank you um yeah. and that's the person character not the band but um mm -hmm. but he that's what you're right he's so easy to be so easy to play in that way because he's already he's already everything's it's just all you have to do is scratch just a little bit and it all just comes pouring out and he can't say to him you're why was your rally so small yeah like he'll go off the deep end right it's crazy it, or you could play him i i've always thought you could play him this other way when we were you know back when the Mueller report was still a thing and we were they were trying to get him to admit to you know russian collusion and all the things i, I always said like just say john mccain colluded with the russians better than anyone he mm. was the best at it maybe ever in history all the best people say so people went up to john mccain with tears in their eyes and i my earring just fell and they were crying and they said sir sir you're so good at collusion and then donald trump will be like wait a minute no I am better at colluding with the Russians. Let Nobody me show you. like Trump. <laughs> oh yeah, do do your Trump. No, I, I can't. can't do a Trump. It's not my Trump. It's Seth Meyers. That's right, Trump. Seth Meyers version. I give him, I give him credit. Yeah. By the way, you and I look like we 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 <laughs> we ransacked Steve Jobs' wardrobe. <laughs> we're marauders. Like I'm. Yeah, I, we're planning a heist. Yeah, yeah. That, it's funny. Yeah, we're um. We do, or I said we look like mimes, but. Um, Steve, Steve Jobs was but it's one of these things that's so random to me that I know this, but people probably know he was adopted. Can you imagine? Really? Like his, yeah. Oh, you didn't know that? No. So, so look at that. I shared a totally random fact. So there are like two people that were out in the world that were potentially smarter than Steve Jobs who created him. And right. We have no idea who they are. Right. Like, and think about the money that they're like, oh, no. Shit. <laughs> Wait a minute. We have given that... up the other one. Why do we keep the other one? <laughs> well, and I think they did. I think they kept a sibling. Actually, I think they do know who his birth Jeez. parents are. But yeah. Uh, so I don't know why I needed to share that randomness. But l let's get back to <laughs> um, ooh, Nikki Haley. And let's compare and contrast. So her sort of sticking it to him last night versus what Tim Scott did last night. I don't know if you saw that. No, I wish yeah, I had, no, I, I but... saw all of it. You know, Nikki Haley has finally found her voice and her ability to uh, attack Donald Trump without being terrified. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to it's going to get more and more amped up as we get to South Carolina. Um, it's a it's a mystery to me, as it is to a lot of people, my, yourself included, I'm sure that none of these candidates ever were like, he's a rapist. He's been <laughs> indicted four times. He's. <laughs> Uh, on 91 felony counts, a judge called him a rape. Like, right. you can't imagine, I, I can't imagine how none of his opponents, none of them, ever, no. even Christie. No. Christie would like be, oh, he's going to be in trial next year. Okay, why, can you tell us why he's going to be in trial? Because he's been <laughs> indicted four fucking times on 91 felony counts and yeah. he's a rapist. Mm -hmm. Like, how could they not bring this up? She's starting to go there. She's also throwing in the, the uh, mental acuity thing. Mm -hmm. All the things she should have said and there are people who are saying, well, she's just going to, like Christy, she's going to turn off the base and end up, well, who cares? She's got nothing to lose. She's exactly. got nothing to lose. So maybe highlighting all of his massive weaknesses and criminality and 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 treason and all his his sociopathic behavior and his, his incoherence is the way to go. I just think it's a little, it might be a little too late. Uh, too too little, too late. Um, and um, uh, Tim Scott, God, mm. how how does that guy sleep at night with himself or look in the mirror? Like how? I mean, he's probably not sleeping with himself. He's sleeping with his girlfriend, <laughs> Beyonce. 
fiance, they're betrothed now. Because oh. it, it reminds me of the movie uh, Waiting for Guffman. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Where yes, Corky St. Clair is always talking about the wife in New York that yes. we get to see in the movie. <laughs> isn't that where? Hey, what happened? Isn't that where that? Isn't that Waiting for Guffman? Yeah. I think it is. And so I, I can't, I mean, I just, how he subjected himself to that kind of humiliation last night, it, it it was painful. And I don't really care for Tim Scott. I couldn't care about Tim Scott, but just, I'm an empath. So it's really hard to uh, get me to a place where I can't even see some kind of c- compassion or feel compassion or sympathy or empathy and I watched him on that stage and I watched Trump do to him what Trump has done to so many people before, yeah. uh, where where someone's loyal to him. And then when they're together on a stage, he just humiliates them. Mm-hmm. It's like a, it's such a sick power trip of like, you my bitch. That's what mm-hmm. it feels like. It feels like he's looking and going, you're my bitch. And don't forget it. And the people just be like, no. Yeah, boss, we 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 don't forget it. We, it, we will it, it. It's like a fetish for him because with he did it with Chris Christie, as we know, infamously. And then they made Chris Christie eat the meatloaf, which I think is, you know, the, the, the Chris Christie's thing of all time. He he needs them to do that, like to show that like they're healing, like like a dog to him. Because they're he knows on on paper, by every measure you could ever have, that they outrank him, that they're smarter than him, more qualified yes. than him, more accomplished mm-hmm. than him. And mm-hmm. and here they are bending for him. And that's like his like he really more than anything else, I think that he gets like, you know, his rocks oh, off doing that because it's the it's narcissist the strong man thing. thing yes like he's up there and in his mind he's like orban he's he's she he's he's whoever he wants to be with and these are his capos he's he's got john Gotti, whatever they're all behind him they yeah. all you know they all fell into place eventually like he knew they would and mm-hmm. oh it's it's sick he's i mean we, we we all talk about him and it and this crazy situation we're in and we've been doing it for nine years now but it, it it is he is so pathologically ill. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's incredible to fathom that we literally in this country have a sociopath who not only was president but is a heartbeat away again from the Oval Office. Uh, it's astounding what has happened in this country. It's sh- it's shameful. Yeah, it's pathetic. Um, and Hillary was right. A good chunk of this country are, are just deplorables. Yeah, exactly. And it says so much about about us because i mean he really does exemplify i just think the worst traits i mean all the seven deadly sins rolled into you know one melon hued messiah i mean it's just he's he's really a terrible horrible person and and as parents it's really hard to reconcile i mean i'm speaking for myself but for me this is like that's one of the biggest problems for me with him is that our, we don't want our children getting those kinds of messages that that's the behavior that we want the world to reward, like mean, petty, making fun of people for their disabilities. Like, yeah. it's yeah. just, as a parent, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not even, like, I used to say years ago that someday when all of this is done, when he's in his Mar-a-Lago in the sky and we can mm-hmm. sort of step back and breathe and try to live the semi-normal life we all let lived in, in America for the past bazillion years with all the challenges we, we faced and have dealt with, um, that his legacy is going to be that he kind of did bring the two tribes together in a way. Hmm. And like before Trump, you could look at a John Kasich, you could look at a Bill Crystal, you can just you know pick your poison and say, oh, those guys are on the other side and they're evil and they're this and they're that. But what Trump taught us is that there's a whole next level of evil. Mm-hmm. And it's Trump and all the people who support his evil. And then everybody else, barring some political differences, are kind of in the same bucket. Yeah. Which is why people like you and me uh, uh, could have people like Stuart Stevens and 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 Rick Wilson and Tim Miller and and Michael Steele. Like people, the, we're now kind of in the same. Mm-hmm. Like, and when it's when it's over, when the Trump era is over, and I've said this to these folks when they're on my podcast, 
you're going to go back to your camp and that's okay because mm -hmm. you're conservative and I'm a liberal, but we're going to look at each other different. We're going to, yep. we're going to look at each other differently than we did years ago. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm pals with Joe Walsh, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Trump did that. Trump yeah. brought, he's so bad, yeah. so evil right. and so dangerous. Yeah. He makes everything else seem minor, like, low taxes for the rich, I couldn't give a fuck. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. Get in the White House, control Congress, do your thing. It'll be done. The next round, my guys will get in. We'll we'll raise the taxes. We'll do our thing. That just seems like elementary living now. It's like now oh, we're yeah. fighting for our, the survival of our democracy. We're fighting for decency, civility, truth, reality. Like, and it's crazy. The people on the other side of the aisle that we've grown to know and love, like they're, they, they are on this, they're in the same battle trenches with us. And it's, that's, that's going to be his ultimate legacy. I think. I think that's absolutely spot on. And it's fascinating because some of my closest friends, I say this all the time, are former Republicans, people that yeah. I, I mean, I used to battle my dad. It was a Republican up until W I used to battle him all the time, but we always ended the conversations with like, okay, what do you want for dinner? And old school politicians used to say that they're, you know, that, there was a lot of camaraderie, you know, but they would battle each other on the, like you said, like shit, like taxes and uh, mm -hmm. they would, you know, immigration and they would have those fights and then they'd go, you know, have dinner and wine. Yeah, and Reagan and Tip O'Neill. Right. You know, the and so in a way, Trump is very restorative. <laughs> we can just, yes. we, we just survive. We need to survive this little hill here. And then, oh. yeah, but it is, it, what you just said is so fascinating because I guess I never thought about it. It's like team normal, right? Like what they say. And, but you do see that the thing that connects us all to each other, like me, like a Reed Galen is humanity. Really? Yes. I mean, that's what the threat that Donald Trump really kind of poses is this attack on yeah. the, on humanity itself. Well, think about it this way, like we, when there's a, a terrible tornado somewhere and it just destroys the neighborhood. And then for the days following, the weeks, the months, everybody, the community, everybody rallies together. You're helping your neighbors pick, you know, find your picture frames and things like nobody's asking anybody if they're a Republican or a Democrat. No. They're just on the same boat. All their houses were destroyed. They're all just trying to help each other. That to me is what it's like in America now on some level and is going to be after the trump thing it, it'll get ugly again because politics is an ugly business but we'll all always have in the back of our heads like man it could be <laughs> it could be much worse and thank god it's not and so at least we agree on the on national security we agree who our enemies are and who our allies are and mm -hmm. and and we shouldn't we shouldn't defund the fbi mm -hmm. and and you know, I, I don't get to have a Supreme Court justice rule in my favor just because I appointed them. All this craziness mm -hmm. that this man, I mean, I, I can't say it strongly enough what a madman he is. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's he's not just like like a rogue Republican. He's not, he's not even a Republican. He's no. just he's a psychopath. Mm -hmm. and, and the fact that this guy, I mean, you see what he did when he was in office of mm -hmm. wanting to shoot protesters or keep a, a cruise ship off of the coast. So it didn't, you know, the, the passengers who had COVID wouldn't impact his numbers. Like he, a, a, Ted Bundy thinks like that. Jeffrey <laughs> Dahmer, not not a, a normal person, especially one who has his finger inches from the, the nuclear buttons. It's insane what we've been living through. And he asked the Department of Homeland Security. I don't know if you've talked to Miles Taylor, but you should if you haven't. He's yeah, he's, he's fantastic. Mm -hmm. it, so he asked, he really did ask about shooting people trying to cross the border. He asked yeah. about a moat filled yeah. with alligators or yeah. electrifying it or putting spikes on top. Like you said, this is like Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy? Am I thinking Al Bundy? Ted Bundy, yeah. Ted Bundy, yeah. very different from Al Bundy. Not Al Bundy. Very Al Bundy. different. Al Bundy. I don't, I don't he think Al Bundy. Was, he was a douche too, but he was funny. <laughs> yes, exactly. And he was but, fake. He wasn't real. That's, was, that's the real. No, and, and Ed O'Neill is an amazing actor. and He really did that, pull that character off. But, but he also, by the way, bragged. And was, I knew he was going to do this. I never brag about being right about anything, but he's so predictable now. He, he set... The story broke that he had enriched himself while president, and it was like seven point million dollars. And I said, "Just watch. He's gonna 
brag and say that he did that and that it means he's smart. And then because Fox is basically an arm of his campaign, they had that town hall with a guy who won't go to the debates. And he did. He said that, essentially said, sure, yeah, it's not easy to make that much money from from all my hotels and properties from foreign governments. So he did exactly that. He he took money from from foreign from other countries that we now are we don't have to guess, right? That money was used to influence policy, particularly as it relates to China. I think we have no idea the depths of how low he and his administration sank when he when they were in office. Yeah. Uh, whatever we think we know. Yeah. It's just probably this, we're just skimming the surface. Um, but just think of how normalized things have come in terms of what he said and what he's done over the years. I mean, he told us right up front, if I shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue, I won't lose support. Mm-hmm. And he was a, a hundred billion percent, right? He knew his audience. But now what he's saying, it's like the 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 upgraded version of that is, not only could I shoot someone on Fifth Avenue, but I shouldn't even be arrested and prosecuted for it. Right. I'm I'm above the law. Yeah. I mean, I could literally assassinate mm-hmm. my opponents using the U.S. military. Not even like some, <laughs> you know, go to Jersey City and like, you know, hire some hitman, you know, hey, just fifty thousand right. dollars, knock off Biden. I can use the military SEAL Team Six. Mm-hmm. And his lawyers in a court of law in the United States are arguing that he should be able to do that. That's how nuts it's become. Imagine Obama. <laughs> Imagine Obama saying, I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> People would, it would be the biggest story in the world. What is wrong? I mean, because the other thing too is what makes someone who's normal say they could shoot someone and get away with it? Hmm. So the fact that you have to, I've never made in my life made a reference like that. <laughs> no, I hope not. Not yeah, even in the black turtleneck. No. I could push this baby carriage in the middle of a bus, in front of a bus. <laughs> Nobody in, like who, if your mind goes to that place, that's like, it's like you're, you're telegraphing how fucking disturbed you are. And, and we yeah. see it. And it's like, the, I was talking to my daughter the other night when we were, well, last night when we were watching the returns and I was like, and I'm seeing the, the Chiron and the whole screen and like Trump went, I'm like, how are we here again? <laughs> How are we here with a dude who is a pathological liar, a sexist, a rapist, four indictments, 91 felony counts, two impeachments? How how are we here? How is he the presumptive nominee? It's it's like half of this country or whatever the number is have lost their minds. They've lost their minds and and sold their souls. I... I always, I, I will say this. I I will usually admit when I'm wrong, usually. And I'm wrong a lot. Um, not all the time, but I, when I get something wrong, I, I, I own it. And I was one of the people who, after the insurrection, and after, of course, he lost, but after the insurrection in particular, I was like, that's it. He's done. They're done with him. There's no coming back from this. They're going to untether themselves. Why would the, what's the upside to staying with this guy? They're, he's gone. He's done. And Aaron Rupar, who's, you know, a, a, a wonderful journalist also and writer, he was like, you're wrong. He's like, watch. I've been paying attention. This is their guy, no matter what. And I was listening to Rachel Maddow the other night, and she's one of the smartest people on the planet. And the way she described what you were just saying, and I think it all the time, and it was one of the questions I was going to ask you what you thought. She was basically saying that those people are here because he's been grooming them. He's been Mm -hmm. like bringing them along and indoctrinating them this whole time with all of normalizing all of this so that by the time we get to a mugshot, a literal picture of him surrendering, he's selling t-shirts that say never surrender and they're lining up to buy them because it owns the libs. I mean, this is like, he's been taking them along on this journey where now he can say, I want to be a dictator. And they're like, yes, we need a dictator. I I mean, (laughs) think about that. These are people who I mean, it's a, it's a it's a proven fact statistically that the majority of people who serve in our military are not the wealthy. They're right. not children of privilege. Right. They're working class families, working class kids. The fact that people who have served this country over the years, over the generations, 
grandfathers, fathers, they themselves, to go fight strongmen, to fight tyranny, to fight fascism and Nazism and and fight dictatorships so that we can preserve our freedom here in this country. The fact that many of those people are saying, yeah, I think it's time for a dictator is insane. It's right. insane. I, I mean, I can't, I'm 64 years old. I, I I never thought in my life I'd see in this country what is happening. It is, it is unbelievable. It really is unbelievable. Sometimes I just have to go, am I, is this a dream or a nightmare? Because this can't be happening. This, this, you know, um, this, this maniac ex reality show host, empty suited, nothing. Like if you carve him open, there's, <laughs> it's like cutting open the shark from jaws, like ah. nothing but hands and like pennies and, and <laughs> dead fish like there's nothing he doesn't have organs he's not none of them none of, that family i i think they might actually be from another planet they might actually be because we've been seeing a lot of the ufos in the sky lately like we might be being invaded <laughs> that might be the like they were the first to land in america and 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 literally they are like it's, it's like subhuman they don't they don't respond to things. Mm -hmm. You know, I could walk down the street and, and see the worst human being in the world. If I see him get hit by a car, I'm going to be like, oh, my God. I run out <laughs> Trouble be, they don't have any empathy, any compassion. They're mm -hmm. tone deaf. They're just, it's, it's startling to see other people who just lack any human emotion. Yeah. They're not, it's like they're not real. So... He he only cares. He he operates solely by by, by his id. What his id dictates. Mm -hmm. It's like whatever's in front of him. So like you and I, for example, if someone asks us a question, most people you start you stop and think. And you go, all right, well, how should I answer this? Like, what if I what whatever I say now might bite me in the ass six months from now? Whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, oh shit, she's taping it. It's on video. <laughs> Be careful. Trump says whatever he needs to say in the moment mm -hmm. to get him to the next five seconds of his life. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care. Nope. So he'll say, I'm not, I'm wearing an orange shirt. Mm -hmm. I'm wearing an orange shirt. And he doesn't care that people are like, dude, you, it, we, we could see it. It's black. It's not orange. He doesn't care. And what's crazy is he has a bunch of people. Yep. 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 It's orange. <laughs> That's his secret sauce, how he got people to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's wearing an orange shirt. Well, That's because all of all of it, I always say this, I call it fictional Trump. Everything about him is based on a lie. It's, it's all a facade. It's all a con. Everything, his business success, his built himself an empire, um, you know, th that he's a patriot who loves America, that he's devout, that he's smart. Um, that he's a family man, yeah. you know, right? So it's 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 all built on a lie. I mean, he's that he's tan when he paints himself orange, or that he, you know, he has a full head of hair because that there, there's like one strip. There's like one strip of hair. It's like over here, and he. The are speaking of the orange. Did you see him last night? I mean, I don't know what happened last night, but like. He, he looks like he's a car that goes through the car wash and and pays for the automatic wax option. <laughs> Like I feel like there's there must be like a thing like a conveyor belt in in uh, Mar-a-Lago where he gets <laughs> up in the morning and like the suit drops from the sky onto his body the red tie has is like and then he moves through this like car wash mechanism that just sort of like sprays him with this orange shit and then when he comes out he just looks like he does every other fucking day since he's been alive <laughs> <laughs> but somebody put a little extra like tan or, or something brown i don't know what's happening it looks it look i used to think he looked like he fell asleep in a bowl uh, like of a spaghetti but now it's like brownie batter or yeah. like and it also like it he he doesn't someone needs to like he needs to go to like barbizon or something because no, someone has to show him how to apply this shit because <laughs> what he does is he puts it so that it's just like a it becomes like a mask yeah so exactly you can see like. the rent like up here it's like it's not the same. It's his natural. He's, he's, I mean, I, he is just out of his fucking mind. And I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted, really. <laughs> but like, think about, sometimes it feels, doesn't it sometimes, do you say, sometimes it feels like, I think, well, there's the alien thing that I'm still cracking up about, but like, sometimes if I often think like, 
are we in a movie? Is this a movie plot? Like, is this can't be real. Batman's coming. Like, we can't possibly have this, like, oompa loompa, like, literal, like, physical joke. Like, uh, uh, I started talking to myself when he became president. Like I, I have two dogs, so I walk them on the street, and I'm I'm obsessed with politics. So I'm I'm always I always have CNN or MSNBC in there or a podcast. But when I have I'm listening to the news when I walk the dogs and they pay, play a, a Trump clip, people will just see me walking and then randomly burst out, "Oh, shut the fuck up already." <laughs> And it was like a little bit of a lull. Like after <laughs> he lost the election, it was like, ah, oh, fuck him. He's gone. The ins insurrection, he's gone. And now it's bad. And now I'm doing the same thing again. I'm like, shut the fuck up or I can get lost. Yeah. How do we get rid of you? How do we get rid of you? Yeah. We can't get rid of him. He's like, he's like he the gum on the bottom of your shoe. He's like a cockroach in a New York tenement. He's just, you can't get rid of this guy. He's like the man. to be like 150 years old. <laughs> Yeah, seriously, what's going on with like the guy is his blood type is Adderall and saccharin and like French fry grease. And he's just walking around like a heart attack, literally waiting to happen. And it's just like, you know what? The universe is like, you know, I think I'm going to go for Robin Williams. <laughs> like, you see, how well, you see, I'll tell you what it is. This is I have this theory okay. that. So, like, if someone pisses you and I off, we look around, we see who's there, and we're like, oh, I got to keep it inside. I can't. Oh, I work with this person. Oh, this is my friend's sister. He doesn't do that. He's like, annoyed? Boom. He just spits it all out. There's okay. nothing inside of him. No. Like, people who get strokes and who have heart attacks and who have anxiety, who get depressed that's rooted in in emo human emotion yeah and it's also rooted in keeping things inside mm -hmm. he doesn't keep anything inside mm -hmm. so he can eat the cheeseburgers he can eat the drink the 15 diet cokes a day it doesn't matter because it's almost like he's stress free you would think i mean think about it i mean if i got a notice in the mail today that the, the the light on the West Side Highway caught me speeding, right? Like, it would ruin my night. <laughs> right. I mean, I'd be like, oh, fuck, I'm sorry. I can't. Right. I can't this dinner, is, you guys are great, but I got to go home because I just, I spent 50 bucks for the thing. How did I do that? I'm so <laughs> yeah. Think of what he, he is in court nonstop with massive, massive criminality. He, he, he could go to prison for the rest of his life. He sits in a courtroom at a defamation trial and not only continues to defame the woman he raped, but he defames the judge. Who the mm. fuck does that? He doesn't care. No. That's the point. He doesn't care. Everything comes out. So at the end of the day, when he lays his fat orange head down on his pillow, he's like, there's nothing, there's nothing inside me that I'm going to think about. I'm just going to take an Adderall and go to sleep. Well, and then I'm going to wake up at three in the morning and then fire off 422 sure. truth posts. But, but like, I always go back to, and Mary Trump had this in her book and her original book, her first book about the family, about Trump's parents, about the yes. kind of like, right, the, the loveless coldness, mm -hmm. stark, the, the just harshness from his dad in particular. But his mom was also, I guess, really tuned out, checked out. But that story about him throwing rocks at the neighbor's baby when it was in its crib, I think that like that to me, that's sort of who he's always been. He's never left that kid. The, well, think about, I know kids do crazy things. And I, I did lots of crazy things when I was a kid. I really did. I, I was not always the nicest kid. I, I painted one boy with green paint because I could. And what? I was a kindergarten yeah was that, finger, that was yeah i'm not proud of it but I've, I've i've evolved that's the difference right so he never did he never stopped being think about what it would take for you at five at five at five you know better to take a handful of rocks and see a baby sleeping and think i'm gonna throw these rocks at that baby and maybe i don't know what'll happen like that's sociopathic but that yeah comes from i think nature nurture but both but like that household feels like and the one he created after for his own children it feels like a, like a vice grip on your soul 
And then it stunts you at a certain point. That's that's like a, I'm not a psychologist by any stretch of the imagination, but I know that people get stunted by trauma. And I think he's stuck as a, that five-year-old kid who was just, just evil and no care in the world for like, maybe I'll kill that baby. I don't know. And he's his kids seem to be the same way. I mean, yes. especially Junior, maybe Ivanka, the, the, the you know, the, 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 the least of it, but um, it's a very dysfunctional family. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there's gotta be, a complete utter, utter lack of love. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he's capable. Do you think, I mean, can you imagine Trump being capable of love? Does he feel love? Can you, can you imagine that? I can. I often have opined about like when they say that Trump is, especially when they say that he loves our troops, that's the one of all of them that bothers me the most. Like, I don't care if you call him religious when I know that he like literally worships every Sunday at Our Lady of the Perpetual Mulligan. I don't care. I don't take that one personally. I take it personally when the guy who said that the, that the fallen heroes of war were suckers and losers, the guy who asked John Kelly, who lost his son to war, asked him, I don't get it. What was in it for them when they died? Like when they say that he loves our troops, that's the one, like that's the one that sets me off like the most, mm -hmm. like, because it's, it's just like you said, I mean, all of those young men and boys who went off to war and, and women later, you know, oh. And, and fought and died for this country. And to think that, like, uh, the commander-in-chief has such little regard. More than that, I would say, because of the way he Spain. hates McCain. He has Spain for them. Yes, exactly. I mean, you just look at the way he talked about McCain, the way he still talks about McCain. Sure. And how, again, it goes back to the question of, like, how does someone, and I have these in my own family, people who have served in the military, who support him, who voted for him twice. I don't understand that. But you have to suspend, you have to, sus you're like basically suspending reality. Like you just, you can't, you can't exist in a real space and also support him if that's true. Right. Well, the, the, my theory on him and his support is, is there's two overriding factors. Not everybody agrees with me, but I can't come up with any other explanation. The first thing is he said it himself. I love the uneducated. Yeah. So he has dumbed down a good chunk of this country to where they just forgot how to think if they were ever able to think in the first place. Yeah. Second thing is racism. These people still cannot get over the fact that there was a black family in the white house yeah. that drives them over every core principle or ethic or moral thought they've ever had in their heads. He is their guy because he wants to take this country back to when those people, no matter how fucking dumb they were or unsuccessful, still had the edge. Mm -hmm. And that's it. It's not economic anxiety. Some of these people have t plenty of money. It's not yeah. about that. It's about, you know, black people have their place. Gays should be prevented from being in society openly. Women should be barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen, blah, blah, blah. The good old 50s. That's what they want. Make America mm -hmm. great again. It's nothing more than make America white again and, mm -hmm. and heterosexual again and male again and blah, blah, blah. They can't stand the change that has come over this country. And, and so everything they teach their kids not to be, they'll accept it from him because of that. Yeah. I think you're, you're absolutely right there. And I think that what happened too is, oh God, read Galen again. He has this great quote about the intersection of like, uh, I forget what it is. I need to look it up. Is it luck and timing? But because of what you just said, because of the the timing of you know Obama's successful eight years in office, people were triggered, didn't know that something like that would trigger them. A lot of people, like there are people who were more blatantly and overtly racist, right? That they would just say this stuff out loud. But then there were the people who like the thoughts were there in their minds and they thought, I can't say that out loud. Like I'm ashamed of those feelings. And so I'm just going to tuck them inside, right? Well, they had all those feelings for eight years. And then this, this guy comes on the scene who's like, you know, those feelings, you know, those feelings you're ashamed of, stop being ashamed of them. <laughs> Don't feel ashamed, lean into them. Yes. I want you to feel yes. empowered by those. Yes. That's exactly it. And that uh, try and try and like take that drug away from people. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Well, it also makes people feel less threatened because, you know, when they say things like, you know, he sounds like us. Well, you really shouldn't want your president to sound like you. Right. I think I'm a pretty smart guy. I'm educated. 
I don't want my president to sound like me. You know no. what I mean? Like, I want my president to sound really fucking smart, way yeah. smarter than I sound. Yeah. And and they don't want that. They mm. want him to sound like the like Uncle Harry who comes to the barbecue and starts telling Asian jokes. That's yeah. what they want. Because that's all the rallies are. You think they're going to the rallies to talk to hear about debts and debt and deficits? They're going to see the Jerry Springer show. They want to be entertained. Yeah. yeah. And so that's all he is. But it's yeah. like, really, that's that's so that's who you want. Why not go to there's plenty of comedy clubs out there. Right. Go. You could be entertained. That's who you want to you want to you want a freaking cheese ball comedian wannabe in in the in a nasty dangerous guy in the White House. That's what you want as president. I I, I don't. And the, the fact is, we haven't even gone to this conversation. But it's like he's not one of them. No, right? He, he offers them him. nothing. No. They, in fact, when they vote for him, they're voting for a billionaire who no. who represents everything that their life is not about. Mm hmm. Right. So they're mm -hmm. voting against their own self-interests when yep. they do all this. That's the craziest thing. Not only is it against their self-interest in the fact that, like, he doesn't do anything for them. He represents a, a threat to the things that they have, the things they rely on yes. that will be taken from them, like their Social Security, Medicaid and Medicare. Like oh. a lot. He's going to attack public education. Um, you know, th that's the. That's the thing, too. And if, God forbid, he were to get his dictatorship, they think for some strange reason, because they must not know how dictatorships work. Nobody's going into like, you know, Mon Pa Magus House in, in Shoot Your Dinner, Arkansas and being like, yes, it is your moment to ascend to the oligarchy of America. No, they're going to go to the work camps and then somebody's going to come in and take their money. <laughs> That's how that's going to work. And if they have a yeah. pretty daughter, they might take her too. And by the way, if you have a kid with special needs or God forbid happens to be disabled, well, forget that. They're screwed if they survive at all. Like, but yeah. they, they're so, they're so selectively and willfully like the cognitive dissonance and it's not yes. a total lack of connecting dots. Like, okay, absolute immunity. Right. Can he march into your house and, and rape your daughter? As long Is as that, the Senate doesn't convict him. <laughs> that's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. Like if he if he can, if they're arguing he can assassinate his opponents. Right. Raping a teenage girl seems a lot less than that, right? Like, is that what you're saying? That it's okay for him to rape your daughter? Because that's the shit we're dealing with. This is the landscape you are trying to harvest here. Mm -hmm. You don't connect the dots. And that's what happens to dictatorship. It's like it starts off with he's like me. I'm good. But it's like that old expression, which I'm never going to get right. But it's like, first they came for this and then they yeah, came yeah, for yeah. and yeah. they came yeah. for me. Like, it's just a matter of time. We we know, just like Hitler, we know Trump has a vision in his head of who's good looking. He has his own rating system. He's yeah. used it in the past. She's a 10. She's a 10. He's not a 10. We know that he has that same Hitler-like obsession with Aryan good looks. Like, it, it, this is what happens. So let's just play this out. So let's say he wins in November. A, maybe maybe it takes him a year or two, but he's so drunk with his authoritarianism that he starts to sit there like Mussolini used to do and go, what can I do today? Mm -hmm. I'll get rid of the gays. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm done getting rid of the gays, I'll get rid of the Jews and, and, the, and the Puerto Ricans and the Italians. And the, it, that's what a dictator does because he can do whatever he wants. And then the, the people who, you know, his enforcers, whether it's the military or whatever, I, I, I just wish people in this country would understand how a democracy unravels. They should watch Babylon Berlin. I don't know if you've ever watched it, but it's an amazing show on TV, uh, uh, Netflix, I think. And it's about like the late 20s Berlin, like as Hitler was just starting to get his brown shirts together and try to get into the system. And you see what Berlin was like. You, it, it, It's so authentic. Hmm. Berlin. Germany was a thriving democracy, the arts, academia, and Hitler eventually destroyed all of that and did what we now know he did, which was bar barbarism. Yeah. But it doesn't happen overnight. No. And so the reason, the, the powers that be that, that enabled and empowered Hitler did it for the same crazy reasons 
that we see it happening in, in this country today. Back then it was the Jews. The Jews were ruining Germany. Here it's like the blacks, the Puerto Ricans, the, the Hispanics, the gays, the trans, blah, blah, blah. Like just pick pick your, your enemy. But mm-hmm. that's how it happens. And this guy getting in the office again, unlike last time without the John Kellys and and the McMasters and 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 uh uh, 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 uh what do you call it uh, what's his uh Bolton Bannon yeah all those guys the guys yeah. that supposedly held up the dam right the adults in the room right no day one it's going to be Stephen Miller it's going to be Steve Bannon it's going to be pillow guy it's going to be God knows you know fucking kid rock is going to be in the cap <laughs> Like, it's going to be insanity. And they're all going to be like, yes, boss, that sounds like a great plan. Let's round up all the gays. Like, that's how it's going to happen. Yeah. Unlike, unlike 2016. Oh, and, then, and, he, and then it's over. Yeah. But, I mean, the, and then he never leaves office. And we end up with Donald Trump Jr.'s, like, son in 2098, like, you know, or his yeah. grandson or whatever. But yeah, I mean. That, that's you, panic. That, okay. So that's panic, Asteroid. Okay. <laughs> well. Realistic okay. asteroid is a diff- is a different animal. Well, let's well well first let me just say that yes, this is definitely playbook because what you know that now they believe this this othering thing is a huge component to it. Obviously, so is the violence inciting and stoking, but like this othering thing. So like in Germany, it was the Jews, and 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 what they've done now is it's just this nebulous they them those people, and it's like they are coming for your insert insert the blank variable, whatever it is, they're coming for it. And it, it, it's it's scary. And we, you know what, things are not working to keep them away from you traditionally. So we need someone, a strong man to come in and break the rules because the rules need to be broken because the rules aren't working and that he's the only one who's fighting for you. He's the only one that will protect you. And so that's, that's what you need. And that's exactly how it happens. And that's how it happened in Germany. And that's how it would happen here if panicked Joe, if that came to fruition as well. But let's Let's just go back to reasonable, rational Andy and reasonable, rational Joe, which doesn't usually exist. But what does reasonable, rational, calm, not panicked Andy think is going to happen? Okay, so what we've learned in the last few years is that the founding fathers, while they created a pretty good structure, they left a lot of holes, right? We know that. Mm -hmm. But the co-equal branches of government thing... uh, it works for the most part. We saw in the last uh, eight years, the courts in almost every single case, even Republican appointed judges, Trump appointed Supreme Court judges, when it came to ruling for or against democracy, for or against a dictator's aspiration, a uh, dictator wannabe's aspirations, they voted with democracy and the rule and upholding the rule of law every single time. Not once did he get a win where the world was like, holy shit, we're, we're in trouble now. I can't believe what the courts just did. Not yeah. once. We also know that, you know, Mark Milley and the military uh, 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 brass, they had their own little cabal. They were like, fuck this guy. They did what Nixon, what, what happened with Nixon, with the, with the Republic, with Republicans and the military. They were like, this guy's drunk. Mm-hmm. So if he gives an order, you run it by, by us first. Which is astounding. When I saw that, I was like, wow, that's that's awesome. Because right? I don't think the military is going to support this guy. With He's not going to be marching down Washington, uh, Pennsylvania Avenue sitting on top of a tank. It's not going to happen. So mm-hmm. when you think about the courts, when you think about the military, and you think about the media, he really can't take over the way a dictator would like. So where can he take over? Well, he can co-op Congress. He's already done that. Yeah. So that can get worse. You know, mm-hmm. Mike Johnson could be totally in Trump's pocket. There could be some crazy thing, uh, uh, you know, on the night of certifying the election that unlike Pence, uh, uh, Mike Mike Johnson tries to pull some shit. But mm-hmm. then it would, it would go through the court system uh, and it would I think it would hold up. And it could just be a crazy White House. It could be a crazy White House press conferences, daily br- press briefings probably won't be fun because God knows who's going to be the, you know, the the, oh. uh, the 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 press secretary. But I really Italian don't government. think I don't think that our democracy would fail. But you never know. I I'm not as optimistic if he got in office that that the, the democracy would hold because I just don't think that they would be able to force him out of office. I just don't see a mechanism. And we don't want 
our military to start intervening and stuff like that. Like that's a slippery slope too. Sure. I just, I, I, what I keep seeing is I don't see any gatekeepers in that party, obviously, but they've been moving the goalposts for so long now with him. The things that I would have thought would have traditionally been the end, his first impeachment, for instance, that the goalposts were moved to accommodate that because there were so there were no Republicans. I think Mitt Romney didn't even vote for that one, did he? Was it no? I think the only time he ever voted to impeach him was in the Romney, second. Uh, yes, the second. Yes. What? Well, yeah. So uh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Or were there two charges in the first impeachment? Am I crazy? I don't know. Um, maybe I'm thinking there were, but, but either way, what discourages me is that back to those holes in the, in the founding father's vision and framework for this country, what he's done is he's exposed them, but he also finds a way to occupy them and then normalize them and then institutionalize them so that the party itself is complicit in like in supporting and embracing them. So mm -hmm. I am not as optimistic in that regard, which is why I'm much more focused, like at least sure. theoretically. Oh, well, look, I here. mean, you know, famous last words are when people say, oh, never, never, never. Oh, right. But, you know, I, I think the 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 House is going to flip back to Democrats because of what they're doing. So they're going to, I think they're going to lose less. They're going to lose less control. And even if he, even if he won, I don't think he'd have a, de a Republican House or a Republican Senate. But we, we have a couple of cases coming up in the courts right now, the Supreme Court. One in particular is the absolute immunity case. Yeah. When, I, when we see a crack in that armor, like if the court comes back and says, you yeah, know, he, he's got absolute immunity, then I would change my tune in a heartbeat. I'd be like, mm -hmm. we're fucked. We are totally fucked because the dam is breaking now. And the institution that I thought was going to save democracy but then you think about the Supreme Court justices, right? These people are appointed for life, mm -hmm. which means they have the kind of power in this country that no one has, no mm -hmm. one. And they weren't elected. Why would they be like, you know what? We're tired of that power. Let's give it all back to a, a dictator. And then he'll do what Netanyahu is trying to do in Israel and get rid of the Supreme Court, weaken our powers. Yes, let's do that. I, I just, I think that absolute immunity case is going to come to a, a ruling. Nine zero. Well, I mean, yes. if if you know they actually did adhere to the rule of law, but but that Supreme Court again, back to you know, that how crazy that is. No other, I think maybe no other country in the world has a Supreme Court like ours with lifetime seats that are non elected. But I think it's absolutely insane. It's just rife with with the opportunity for corruption, which as we've sure. seen yep. is happening. But I talked to Eric <laughs> Siegel, who's like a, a a constitutional professor, and he said we shouldn't be holding our breath on having the Supreme Court rescue us when it comes to Trump. So he thinks they'll rule positively as it, as it pertains to repro because they're, they know that it would be the nail in the coffin for the Republican party. If they, if they don't on Mifra Perstone and on um, M. Tala, I think those are the two right. cases going before them, but he doesn't think we should be expecting. No. Anything Probably. regarding Trump, which makes me very nervous. We should never expect anything with Trump because the mere, like I said, the mere right. fact that he's, He's where he's at today on our television screens, television screens. Yes. Good point. It means with this guy, anything can happen. And I've said this a thousand times. Conventional wisdom in the last eight, nine years has been completely out the window. The exact opposite of everything we thought would happen has mm -hmm. happened. So yeah, you're right. You're right. anything, any, when it comes to Trump, anything could happen. But I do... I try to I try not to I try not to for my own sanity swirl in a world of hypotheticals. I try to look in the rearview mirror and say, okay, what are the trends? Where have we been? Because that tends to help give a a, a window into where we're going. Mm. And there's no reason to think the court system in this country will support a, a, a dictator's uh, uh, aggressions. There's no reason to think that um, the FBI, the Department of Justice, is going to be co-opted um there's there's no i just don't see the, the the real safeguards uh losing any ability to 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 keep doing what they're doing to, pr to protect and preserve our democracy but yeah i hope you're right i know i think you're i hope you're right i would also say that like stopping him before that i think that the I don't where I'm more optimistic, actually, is I don't really think the public, even the party itself, I think I don't really think they're there. 
for him. That's my daughter coming home from school. Um, I don't think, um, I don't think largely they are there for the, I think predominantly people are like, you know what? I don't like democracy. I think I want to keep it. And even the idea that he might be a threat to that is enough. And plus, like you've heard all these people in New Hampshire in particular saying, I voted for him twice. I can't vote for him with all of the stuff that's happened since 2020. But I, I think I look to elections like what happened on issue one in Ohio and how 17 Trump districts voted for issue one to enshrine reproductive rights in their constitution. And I'm like, I think that that's a good bellwether for mm -hmm. where most of the country really is when it comes to the threats uh, against democracy. That's where mm -hmm. I that's where I guess I'll park my optimism. But I was also wrong. I thought Hillary would win in 2016. I thought Roe would never get overturned. So I'm not always. No, wrong. I think you're right. And it's like the like the uh, was the emperor's new clothes. Or whatever. Yeah. It's like none of these people, Tim Scott, none of them are inside going, man, this guy is the best <laughs> president we've ever had. And I, I'm so excited. They're all just like, they're on a ledge and they're just trying not to fall. That They're terrified of, mm -hmm. of falling. And to them, falling means having him and his, his Indians, his brainwashed cultists, uh, unleash their torrent of, 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 of hate and anger and mocking and whatever, you know, they fear the tweets, they fear the truth social posts. And it's, it's, they're just cowards. They're such cowards. That's the thing. It's like at the end of the day, they're just cowards. Kevin McCarthy, Lindsey Graham, all of them cowards. Rubio, Ted Cruz. Yeah. And they I talk mean, about Democrats, where are the, where are the snowflakes? Fuck yeah. off. And and they're so far afield now as a party that they don't even have their rudderless. They don't even have platform or policy. In particular, like these House Republicans, they're just MAGA. I mean, whatever. They don't have they don't have any positions. They don't stand for anything. They literally don't have their best option. Their most feasible option for president is the guy who is tried to steal the office he's trying to run for to shield him from prosecution for the crimes he committed while in office and after like this is their best option because there's not there's not a party anymore they don't they don't stand for anything they don't accomplish anything they don't care they don't want to they don't want government they really don't most of them i mean i don't know if there's still some establishment rhinos in office somewhere that i haven't seen who are on the news every night who are like you know we really kind of want to be here to like do things for our constituents like should we be doing that i don't know where they are but i think as a whole the party's just completely like i said rudderless it is rudderless and 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 getting worse yeah. it's really like it is the it's like the trump tannic you know <laughs> And and like t here's here's Tim Scott like oh man here's the Trump Tannic and it's headed straight for the Berg I'm getting on <laughs> like right, right. <laughs> you're getting on it now like <laughs> like well there is that slight chance that it'll miss the iceberg and then I'll become a cabinet member. And that'll happen. That's like, I mean, it's just, I mean, the calculations here. Uh, uh, Rick, Rick Wilson's book, Everything Trump Touches Dies. It it has proved right every single fucking time. Every time. Except for his tiny, 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 tiny inner circle of Steve Bannon, who who also got thrown out under a bus at one point. They, they all just get thrown under the bus. A year from now, whatever. After the election, you think Tim Scott is, hey, thanks, Tim. We tried. We tried, but we lost the good fight. You know, like <laughs> he's going to be, Tim Scott blew it for me. Like it, Tim Scott is going to end up on a roller coaster. They all are. There is there all going to be trivia question answers like oh guys remember that guy that senator from south carolina he, like literally like just licked trump's balls for like a good six months straight um he, he threw kelly mcinerney mcinerney or whatever how he's right, saying right if you throw mcinerney under a bus then then literally you're like ivanka could be thrown under a bus which and, he's done that too like yeah he that's the, that's the part i'm waiting for this is where this greek tragedy ends is where the whole and, and and I say this without any humor whatsoever. I say this as someone who felt horrible when this happened. But remember, after the Madoff crisis scandal, one of the sons killed himself. Like, yeah. this is what happens when when you're so powerful that you delude yourself into thinking that you are insulated. Your family is insulated from anything. And just like Madoff in his own way was kind of sociopathic and corrupt, so is Trump. 
that family, the Trump family, it's like it was like like watching Michael Jackson in the last year. Like it's just you could see it is not going to end well for mm -hmm. any of them. For any of them, in their own way, they are going to go through the 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 um the tragedy that is their dad that he has set up for them. And I feel bad for the kids. I feel bad for Baron. I feel bad for you know the 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 the, the ones who are not operating with him and helping him complicitly helping him achieve his madness you know there are innocent kids there that that got to grow up with that name the name that's been taken off of buildings everywhere imagine going through life being a 10 year old now who has to grow up with that name yeah i think they're hoping that 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 name will be etched in buildings because you'll be the supreme leader and there'll be a, i wrote like a, a sub stack about this like this dystopian future where everything is named trump and and oh, yeah and people are like wait a minute how did this happen but the but the whole trump but the whole trump like i call it like a, a crime syndicate really not that innocent children but the but the lara trumps and the eric trumps and the, sure. you know even ivanka and jared i feel like it's on a tightrope and 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 they've been sort of navigating certain gales here or there, but now it's like Hurricane Sandy is descending upon them. They they know it. They're trying to act like everything's fine. It's like the the animal house kind of like Kevin Bacon. Remain calm. Everything is fine. Like all is well, and it's not well. It's going horribly. They're all completely fucked, and they know it. And they're trying like how can you not know it? But they're trying to like make it all seem like ugh, that he's gonna everything's gonna be fine. He's gonna be president again, and the America will be great again. And it's just all ridiculous mm. but since i've already had you a very long time i'm going to pivot to my what i call my totally random rapid fire question round sure if you're if you're, if you're ready oh for it okay number one. Oh, okay what song lyric did you get wrong a mm. large part of your life until one day you were like wait a minute oh god what? Or was there none? Like, did you get all of Elton John's lyrics? Like, <laughs> oh, and in fact, I recently learned in Rocket Man, one is like uh, something. The real lyric is like uh, burning up the fuel out here alone. And I, 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 what I was singing my whole life was not that. I didn't even know that was a lyric in that was. song. Yeah, it's like Rocket Man. Da, na, 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 here alone. I've never known what that well, line about, was. Like fuel and burning, and I and like I, I don't know what I was singing. Uh, I just, look, there's a million songs I can't think of. But that's a good one I've because done, but, yeah, so with Elton John, you're just at some point you're just you're just and well, like Benny, like no well, like Van Morrison is like that too. <laughs> like what is he singing? <laughs> I think he went like all weird anti-vax. But uh, for me, I would always, too, there was two. It was like, the, a bad moon on the rise was bathroom on the right. There's a bathroom on the right. And that works. It makes sense, <laughs> right? But sure. then this one makes no sense. We don't carry lighters. <laughs> Big old jet airliner. We don't carry oh, lighters. Oh, we don't care. Uh-huh. <laughs> but why would anyone write a song about that? Why? Yeah. I wish I could remember. I know I have a million. Oh, you have a cat. I feel bad when I learn. Yeah, I have two cats. Two cats, oh. two dogs, and a <laughs> fuckload of fish. <laughs> yeah, I just feel like every Elton John song ever, especially Benny and the Jets, I'm like, I don't know what you're saying, but I'm going to just sing along. Um, although I made a point to learn Leave On, to learn all the lyrics to that one, because oh, Leave On is one of... That's like a tough like one. That's one a good of his songs. Yeah, right? Leave on now. It's those balloons. All day. I, think, <laughs> I think if you have a really distinct voice, which a lot of the great ones do, yeah. El, uh, um, um, Elton John, uh, Van Morris, like you could, your style is so strong that you literally could just make up words. Right. <laughs> Mick Jagger. Van Morris could literally be like, <laughs> <laughs> we don't care. It's just Nobody like cares. his voice is so amazing and smooth. Yeah, it's like the melody is great. It's like, who cares what he's yeah. saying? Nobody cares. If, I don't know. Joe Cocker really could, honestly, Joe Cocker could sing anything. And if it was just complete mumbo jumbo, I would be fine because I think he's got one of the greatest voices of all time. But okay, question two. 
What's something you did when you were younger that you can't imagine doing now? Handing out bumper stickers and buttons for Richard Nixon in 1968. Wow. That was 90. You yeah. did that? Yeah. Why? It's a good question. Um <laughs> No, this is actually something I ask a lot of my guests because I, I'm curious if in when they were in single digits, did they do anything that sort of led to the career they, they have now? Hmm. Like, you know, I have a friend who used to make all these little rocket ships and he grew up to be like a science professor at the college because wow. he was always. So I think it's where I first got my taste of politics. I, I, I obviously wasn't Republican. I was nine. So mm -hmm. it's like. But I just, I kind of dig what was going on at the local Nixon headquarters in my neighborhood. And, and I was like, wow, and the buttons look cool and bumper stickers. And so that was like my first um, memory of doing something weird, but mm. actually sense in the big picture. Yeah. Did you get a sense of like when he was elected? Did you get a sense of like, hey, I did that. I helped do that. I took all, the, I gave myself the entire credit for his presidency. Is it your fault? Are you to blame me? Hold on. No, it was, yeah. I didn't use the word fault. It was more like credit. No, credit, credit. Uh, no I, I did not make that connection. And then I, I did meet him at an airport once. And I was kind of thrilled. Yeah. I was coming off of, at, at the uh, LaGuardia shuttle terminal. The, the planes from uh, the flights from Boston and D.C. used to literally just the plane and people would depart at the same time out, out of the terminal. And I got off a plane from Washington, uh, from Boston. He got off a plane from Washington and we were just, I just happened to notice he was, and I did this really cheesy thing. Like um, I, I wanted to meet him, but I, he was, he had a, a, a security with him and uh, it was not easy to get right to him. So I walked ahead of him real quick and then I stopped and turned around as if like I forgot something. And literally I was like, I'm going to turn around and almost boom, Nixon's going to walk right into me. And then that'll be it. Like the, the security secret service won't have time to, and that's literally what happened. And I was like, no. Oh, president Nixon. Oh, I'm a big fan. I, I pre, you know, I'm just an honor to meet you. And he was like, Oh, oh well, my pleasure. God. Or, you know, that was really kind of dangerous. Or they could have been like, that guy just did a sudden movement and shoot you dead. <laughs> In retrospect. <laughs> Yes. When I think about that now, I could have been not only wrestled to the floor as Secret Service often do to people, but they could have shot me in the head. <laughs> you know, it was, great, it was a, kind of a weird yet great story for my uh, ancestors. My, my uh, what do you call it? Uh, my um, offspring. And my... He died doing what he loved best, not attacking Richard Nixon. It'll be the subject of countless TV shows. Was he just trying to suck up to Nixon, or was he actually trying to kill him? Was he, was, Nobody knows. Was, Nobody. He, he was trying to assassinate him with his forehead. Yeah. <laughs> that was the plan. I'm, I'm trying to kill him with my briefcase. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like the FBI is going to be listening to this. Yeah. yeah like, no, what are they? They're wearing black turtlenecks. They're talking about assassinating the president. No, and now I'm really careful, like with anything. Even like if I tweet, I don't. I, like I'm not even remotely. Like I don't want any Secret Service person to be like, especially when Trump was president. Like, what is what is he saying here? Yeah. So like, mm, yeah. Mm, mm. yeah. Yeah. I figure I've got I'm I've I've got a reservation in the gulag if he is if he does get elected. So I'm I'm yeah. not careful, but I probably should be a little more. Uh, we we might be sharing a cell. I I want the top bunk. That's all I require. I just think it's I like it up there. Done. Thank you. Um. Last random question. Uh -huh. Oh, well, this kind of goes back full circle now to what we talked about because you didn't know that. Um. Um. Steve Jobs was adopted. What is the most useless, useless, I say that with air quotes, piece of information you know? Like you're at a party and everybody's like, I know. And you're like, oh, yeah, I got one. Uh, oh, there's a cat again. You know any random facts about cats? Most useless piece of information. Wow, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. I'm on the spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a time in my life that I thought that everything I knew was useless. <laughs> and I'm not that far off from that now. <laughs> well, you did know that useless piece of information. I don't think it's useless, but about um, LaGuardia Airport. I wouldn't have known that about the mm. planes coming in at the same time. Yeah, I do. I do know. I, I'm, I do know a lot of useless information. I just can't think of it now. It's a hard probably, spontaneous. Probably question. because it's useless. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, for me, because I'm I'm. I'm a Gemini, and I think that that excuses lots of 
behavior patterns that I don't want to accept um, are my own doing. So I tend to fixate on little facts because I can't I can't really delve into anything very deeply. So I kind of just stick at the superficial level with a lot of stuff. And one of those things that I think is fascinating to me are animal group names. So mm. like like a group of crows is called a murder. A murder? A murder of crows. Wow. In fact, I forget what the band name was now. Black Crows? Counting, counting Crows. Counting Crows. Yeah, I think one of their first out al- their first album maybe was the Murder of Crows, and really? like, and it's that it, it. I will send you down a rabbit hole. I will send everybody down a rabbit hole because once you get started, you're like, wait a minute, is that a tuxedo of penguins? What a a crash of rhinos, and it's completely fascinating. It, and is it, it really, is it really a tuxedo of penguins? Yes, it is. And um, the I forget what owls are. I'll have to look it up. But owls are even parliament a parliament. A Parliament of Owls, and it's a Tower oh. of Giraffes. Like, see, this is the kind of stuff that I get so geeky on. I, oh, that is, that is, that knows we're talking about animals. I don't that, know what it. Goes that back. is um, <laughs> could be useless, but it also is really interesting. A stench of skunks. Yeah. Right. Like that and makes the, sense. And the Tower of Giraffes is great. Yeah. I but like I was in education for a long time, and I, one of the most wonderful jobs I got to do was to work in like this resource room with a bunch of like third and fourth graders who needed a little extra help. And I would put up a trivia question every day and it would be, what is the group of blank called? And uh, so that's completely useless information that I have in mind. Hey, I got to say, I don't, I don't think that's useless. <laughs> now. Good information. That's knowledge. <laughs> it's like something you teach your, your kids. True. But the thing is, all animals have several group names. It's not like that 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 that's sort of a genus scientific group name, mm-hmm. but like that's those are the group names that scientists have probably come up with over time that they mm-hmm. think are reflective or funny or interesting or memorable or whatever. And then oh. someone like me comes along and they tell someone like you, and then you have it in your mind. And the next time somebody asks you for some useless piece of information, it'll say, you know what? I don't know that this is useless, but I do know, for instance, and then you'll think of me and that your cat's butt will pop up in your mind. <laughs> It's like it did. Um, I'm not. I'm not naturally a cat person. My daughter mm-hmm. is a cat person, and I'm a dog person. Me and too. I somehow ended with, ended up with two cats. Cats are just. They know when to fuck with you. <laughs> I'm not a cat person. <laughs> I have two cats, and I and literally they'll be in one corner of the room, and they'll be like, "What is he doing now? What is he doing? <laughs> oh, oh, wait, wait! He's opening his laptop. Let's now run on him. Like, like they just know exactly." Like when I have, no, look, come on. You just deleted my document. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, no, that's why I can never do that. I'm a dog, very much a dog. My dog is literally wagging her tail knowing I'm somehow talking about her. I have a cat. He's fine. He's fine. I mean, we do have cat and cats are fine, which is a much more dog oriented person. But yeah. I, so, yeah. And the cats, the dogs don't just walk up to you and stick their butts in your faces when you're on podcasts. You know, that's just. No, and, and cats mm-hmm. like, you know, like if, if you pet, like if I pet my dog. Literally, you could like in a movie, you could see like the clock, like you know, two days later, my dog is still there going, pet me some more. Right, right, right. My cat, if I pet my cat, she's like, Oh, this is awesome. This is so awesome. Oh, and then I'm gonna claw your eyes out. <laughs> and then my daughter will be like, Well, she had enough. And be like, <laughs> like one so- minute of petting, and now she wants to kill me. Like, <laughs> yeah, this is why I'm not a cat person. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Or like I, I pet you and feed you, and then you're like on my lap, and then you're just gone. You're like, I need, I need to be gone. <laughs> now she's like, I hear you talking about me. I'm not sure about <laughs> she's about like, me. I'm going to find her in I'm her gonna... turtleneck. Um, <laughs> so I kept you a long time. Okay. You have your podcast, The Back Room. How's mm-hmm. that going? Great. I'm having the most fun I've ever had in my life. That's awesome. Yeah. That's good. I was, I studied broadcast journalism in school. I didn't ever get a job in broadcasting because a i didn't go to a great school i graduated from brooklyn college i didn't go to northwestern i didn't go to columbia i didn't have a pedigree degree mm-hmm. uh, i also didn't have like amazing grades and like you know out of my class i was the top of the class i you know i, I got by got a degree and then fell into marketing for, for as my career but i always I, I i kept writing things and doing things and uh, right before my, uh, wife died in the, in 2006, I was doing like a public access talk show, kind of like the early iteration of podcasts, like a Wayne's world kind of show on, on like mm. time Warner cable. And it was politics. And I interviewed Mark Marin and Katrina Vanderhoel and Congress people and had a co-host friend of mine. 
so I kind of kept my uh, toes in the water, so to speak. And then, um, but then I realized like, you know, doing this podcast, it's like, I, I've actually, I'm now doing what I was born to do. Hmm. It's kind of a cool feeling. Well, so, how about that? It, and I, it's time to get here, but yeah. But you, but you, you can, you hear that because in, in your interviews, you're just, there's this natural, you know, conversational, easy style where you, you interviewed me and there's just a natural conversation. That one was so tough. I'm I, telling you, that was, getting through that one was crazy. It was like milking a stone. Yes. I'm so tight-lipped and I'm, I keep things so close to the vest. I just don't ever share and over talk um, or over share and over talk but no but being having been interviewed by you and having listened to your interviews there is just this like like you don't feel like for me like I always have a paper where I'm like I gotta do depending on who I'm interviewing it's more structured than not but like you just it's just this natural like the best interviewers have that natural style where it's just a conversation between two people and then people tell you things like I told you I took off my shirt and you know people tell you things because they feel comfortable and that's not just something you can manufacture or like you know take a pill and you wake up being able to do it it's something you you work on but also something that's inherently true about you so well, I, I try to be relaxed like I'm totally nude when I do my podcast <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, that's funny. That's how I start because <laughs> I want to, you know, that's how I came into this world. And that's how I want to do podcasts. But um, <laughs> it's so weird. That I, have your my, I have my notes. Huh? <laughs> it's so weird that your guests come dressed like were they born in a, a turtleneck? No. And if they yeah. were, that's weird. Yeah, we're, I think we're, no, they come there because we're, I think we're the only fully nude podcast. <laughs> In the in the news and commentary section, um, <laughs> Lauren Boebert's is uh, yeah, not fully. Yeah, um, no, I do, I do, I do homework. I have notes. I mean, I'm audio only. Your video, so like, so you don't see my piece of paper, but I have one. Some mm. are easier than others. It depends on who I'm interviewing. If I'm interviewing yeah. uh, like a political media type, then it's just literally like two people sitting in a bar talking because yeah all this shit is right in my head. But if I interview someone that's had a long and illustrious career, either as an academic or an author or a filmmaker or some kind of entertainer, like I, I, I have to do way more homework for that, which I enjoy doing. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so it just, it just depends, but it's, um, it's just fun. I mean, you, isn't it fun for you to just talk to people about stuff you like and, talk to people you admire and people you like usually this wasn't fun but usually <laughs> well you know what everybody tells me that they're like oh god thank god it's over and he's gone <laughs> no no it, Ooh, no that guy is like pulling teeth <laughs> no it's oh no that this was particularly fun i mean i literally laughed my head off when you were talking about the aliens and Trump being the shark from jaws um you laugh, gonna... right? if you don't laugh you just left with a trump with no insights <laughs> I'm probably going to steal that for my sub stack, just so you know. Go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. I will not attribute it to you. I'm kidding. Um, no, I, yeah, no, I, I feel like, first of all, going back to what you just said about just like really loving what you do, like really like feeling like you love what you do. And that translates in what you create, you know, if, if that's the truth, then that comes out in what, you know, the product is and that you can feel that when you have a conversation, you, you know, that this is a person who's not just like phoning it in. This is something you enjoy doing. And that's how you end up being good at it usually. But so, yeah, I personally, I don't, I'm not good at it, especially well yet, but I'm getting them trying, but I have yeah, so I much it. fun. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm still, I'm really just a baby um, in this podcasting space. Like I haven't been doing this all that long, so I'm still how many, how many episodes have you done so far? Oh my goodness. I don't know. Um, maybe are you like, like 40, like, 30? Right? Yeah. So I, I think, I mean, if I went back to my early ones, I probably would be horrified <laughs> like anything else. You, 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 the more you do it, the more you get into a rhythm of, not just the conversations, but the prep and the editing and whatever. Like it just, it's just, it's it's so much easier. And then when it's easier, there's so much more fun. Yeah. 
Uh, and you're more natural and relaxed. And I think that's the key. Because when you're natural and relaxed, then your guest is natural and relaxed. Yeah, which like I, I, I love watching TV and seeing somebody on CNN and going, wow, they were brilliant. That was a great inner, like, and then I'll just look them up and figure out a way to get to them. Uh, yeah. You know, and it's, it's, it's just fun. I, I mean, I don't, I've had a different life. You know, I was in marketing for 35 years. I've also dabbled in film and, and TV. I'm working on something now with a studio. And I, I've, I have a, a retail store that I am a partner in. I run a foundation. So this is like coming at a time in my life where I'm actually, for the first time in my life, having fun at something mm. as if it's like, you know, I mean, you go, you've gone through life and you hear people say like, oh, God, my work. It's so fun. It's not work. It's fun. Yeah. Like how did how did that happen? Like how do I get that? You know. Yeah. And um, this is just fun. Uh, it's just really really fun. This last week, I interviewed, uh, and these are the episodes that have posted since Saturday, and will continue to post this week. But first one was uh, Representative Jasmine Crockett, who I've interviewed before. Rock star. And, and Edie Falco, and then uh, tomorrow will probably post my interview with Frank Rich, former drama critic in the New York Times. Wow. And uh executive producer of Succession and Veep, and the White House Plumbers. Like he's this is he is a legend. Frank Rich is a legend. He was an op-ed columnist for 14, 15 years in the New York Times. Um and so it's like living out a dream of being able to talk to the people who I have felt are so accomplished and so successful and so brilliant and just interesting to hear the way people speak and the way their minds work. Uh -huh. you know? I'm a kid from Queens. My father was a taxi driver. And when I think about the ability to talk to some people that I'm talking to, it's just like crazy. Like I really feel like uh, it's just the greatest thing in the world to be able to from where I came from yep. to, to hear and listen to and be inspired by some of the most brilliant people in this country, you know? And when you think about with everything in your life, with tragedy, and again, I have told you, you know, separately from here, but I am very sorry. My, you know, my heart breaks for you for the loss of your wife. That is a horrible tragedy. And I, I know I can't even imagine um, what that is like to deal with still, and especially then. But you have been through so much in your life that has been good and bad and, and in between. And you've had joys, highs, lows, all those things. And when you think about the journey from the kid in Queens with the taxi driver dad to this guy who's finally at your age now, which is really fucking old, like finally in this this. <laughs> You you're supposed to do that when you're on the street. You couldn't see him if you're not watching. Yeah, oh, I will be. Trust yeah. me. I'll, but like, I'll but like, Trump says, and then I'll be like, <laughs> see, I'm not capable of being all sentimental because then people are like, she's so lame, and but I cry. But but and I would cry if I really went there. But but I mean it. Like with your your life, you know, it's not everybody has that moment where they can get to this point where you've gotten to now where you're like, wow. I really love what I do for the first time. I really love this. And how lucky am I? And it's not luck because you've earned it and you've worked for it, but it manifested it. But like what an amazing journey. And you have to kind of look like everything, not that they had to happen to put you where you are, but in some way, all of the things that you've been through have put you where you are, you know? Well, this, my philosophy is that this world can be a really, really bad place. And it can also be a really great place. You just got to find how to deal with the bad shit and how to, you know, how to acquire as much of the good shit as you can. And it's there. I mean, it's just, you know, I, 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 I feel fortunate. I'm certainly not privileged or entitled. Nobody get, ever gave me anything. I went to public schools, public colleges, like worked through college, but paid room and board to my parents. Like hmm. about that, you know, like- wow what we do with our kids. Like, you need money? You need money? <laughs> right. Let me just bend them up. Let me bend them up. closed until you pony up, you know? <laughs> right. my, my <laughs> you didn't pay this month's them. rent yet. I'm like, dad, you're my dad. I am not supposed to pay. So, um, and so it's, it's, uh, it is, it is a, life is a journey. It's like that's cheesy poster. It's a journey, not a destination. Right. And yeah. so unfortunately for some, it's, it's 
there's there's greater swings. It's, it's more of a roller coaster. I would love to kind of flatline through life like a lot of people I have a little blip here, a little blip there. My my life has had crazy, crazy highs, crazy, crazy lows. Mm -hmm. So for me, I don't know how anyone else would have dealt with it, but for me, it's kind of made me who I am in a in a good way. I've taken horrible tragedy and tried to spin some gold from it, created a foundation, the Adrian Shelley Foundation, which supports women filmmakers. We've given out over a hundred production grants since 2007, including right. Chloe Zhao, who won an Oscar in oh. 21, I think, wow. or Nomadland. She got a grant from us, I think, in 2012 when she was making short films. Hmm. And, you know, we have Dee Reese, we have Miriam Keshevers, we have so many uh, women who have gone on to achieve great success. And we've been a part of that. Um, hmm. And so, it, it you know, it wasn't enough to just have a tragedy something good has to come from that and so i just i take the good with the bad you know i have my bad like everybody else everybody's got bad you know mm -hmm. um and we all have some kind of trauma in our yeah. life and we all learn to deal with that trauma some people have tra trauma with kids some people have trauma with relatives dying of heart disease some people have car accidents joe biden our president look at his yeah. Um, everybody's got something and we're all faced with that choice of what do we do now? You know, mm -hmm. my choices, they, they've, you know, I hope they've been good for my family, for my daughter. And I think they've been good for me and how I deal with life's up and downs, but mm -hmm. you know, and it's not like it's over, like there's more life, you know, yeah, <laughs> I, right. I hope to, to be a hundred. So it's like, oh my God, 35 more years of up <laughs> downs. Like, I don't know if I can take that, but yeah, but I think that we talked about this again, bringing this whole thing full circle about humanity. You know what I mean? I think, um, you know, all of the ups and downs and you paying it forward and you understanding that, you know, there's not, I wouldn't say opportunity, but there are things you can do to turn tragedies into opportunities for others. You know, I think that's definitely this, this, this idea of humanity that, that, that weaves us, connects us together. And that's the thing that like makes us find this connection with people who were across the aisle from us a few years ago, well, a lifetime ago. But it's, it's this, that's where I feel like that's where we win this, this war, you know, it's like finding the connections in each other when you know, everything else is, is sending us the opposite messages, which is division and, um, you know, and, and fighting. And uh, so that's something that I think is really fantastic about you. Um, is that you can lean into that and you have conversations that are just human con connection conversations, um, sometimes bigger than that, but obviously that's a component of it. And I think it's so important. Yeah. No, I, I have had people on my show who I, I call my tragedy buddies, people I've met along the way who have had real horror in their lives, like real like crime horror, murder or shit like that, because it's like a, it's a little, it's a little group, a private group that, you know, you, 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 it's a shorthand that you speak with people. You they've walked your shoes, you walk their shoes. And so I try to bring that into the podcast a bit, you know, uh, yeah. so that maybe it inspires someone who's going through something or been through something that, you know, uh, that you you can. I mean, I, my friend Kevin and, and his wife uh, Marina, they they had two of their kids early on murdered by the nanny. And my friend uh uh Chrissy, her husband was stabbed to death on a street in Brooklyn. Like it's just, it's all over. You see it. I mean, just pick up the New York Post or the Daily News every day. There's stories like this every day. Yeah. But we don't know them, and maybe it's a good thing that that's we don't we don't. It's always over there until it's mm -hmm. over. For me, it became over here, and then once it became over here, then I started to make an effort in a way to meet other people who had something like that because it the, it's really helped get through you know when, when people can wade through all the platitudes and and know how life sucks and and because they've been there in that same way yeah so um you know yeah. a lot of people that go through that yeah and, and i talked to school shooting survivors and talked to fred gutenberg and Brett Cross and others who've lost loved ones in school shootings. And and they have this same thing where you just said, well, I would always sort of think it was over there. It was happening to somebody else until I was the one it was happening to. And they 
you know, like you do weaving it into just what you do in your life. Like for them, there's this idea that like they want to go out and share these stories and humanize these things that are happening so that other people don't just have this disconnect. You know, it's like there's a real human connection so that we don't get numb to stuff because we can't. Mm -hmm. Well, on that happy note. Um... <laughs> oh, well, wah, wah. <laughs> no. We want to talk about now. Hey, can we talk about genocide? Like, what's... <laughs> no, God, Jesus! I just laughed at that. What's wrong with me? <laughs> I must have like coins and cans inside of me too. I am also the shark from Jaws. Um, yeah. You can edit them. What's that? <laughs> yeah, definitely Hello. edit out the part where. It's yeah. No. Uh, but, uh, you know, honestly, as, as heavy as things are, this is life, right? This is the, this is the ebb and flow that is life. It's not always one way or the other. And even when, when it feels really dark and it feels overwhelming, you feel like you're going to succumb to it all. It, like even the crazy with Trump, there's there's yeah. you have to find a, a, a buoy a, or a buddy or like a life vest unless you're That's Tim it. Scott and you're getting on the Titanic, in which case life vest is not going to help you. Yeah. He's in, he's in a <laughs> ride. <laughs> yes i i often compare it to that um that submersible too it's like yeah, they're all getting on the submersible and they're like let's go to the bottom yeah good luck uh, happy trips i mean happy trails whatever i don't know what you say when people go submersibling but um well i guess uh that really does conclude this episode um thank you again andy this was fantastic it was it was a journey it really was it was like it was a meandering road and I appreciate that you were on that road with me for this long. So thank you for that. And right after this, uh, you and I are going to Steve Jobs a con, right? <laughs> we are all, we're dressed up for the, it's like, yeah, the Javits center. We're going to, to <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a, it's a crossover event. Um, yeah, right. between Steve Jobs and mimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's a very, very specific sect of the population. Um, yeah, podcasting, Steve Jobs cosplaying mimes. Um, well, thanks, yeah. thanks for having me. This was great. I really enjoyed this. I really enjoyed it too. And thank you for um, having the clock that's made me think I'm in John, being John I'm Malkovich. And thank you to your cat's butt for making several appearances on the video. Quite a butt. Quite a butt. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Annie and everybody else. Annie, you too. Have a great week. Everybody else, see you next week.